uh, I believe so strongly in who we are, what we do, and what we are trying to accomplish for this country. But, you know, we face a lot of rhetoric uh, from lawmakers, uh, wherever the capital is, I'm not sure in relation, it's, well, there it is. Uh, <laughs> We face a great deal of rhetoric from our lawmakers and from our policymakers and from uh, the American public, uh, and it, it's time that we start changing that. Um, you know, I, I look at the presumptive Republican nominee calling for a ban on people in this country if you're a Muslim. Uh, you know, at the same time, we look at the kind of multi-pronged attacks that we're seeing across the nation in our state houses, attacks on women through their reproductive rights, attacks on LGBTQ people through their civil rights, even attacks on children. Earlier this year in Tennessee, a, a law was passed <clears throat> that allows uh, uh, mental health counselors to deny treatment uh, if they don't agree with what the outcomes are of their potential client, uh, literally. Uh, so it's, it's vague in the way it's written, but if you are a, a gay kid in Tennessee you have to be careful what counselor you choose. Basically, that's what it, it ultimately means. In Mississippi this year, and I hope all of you voted during our March Bill Madness, uh, but in Mississippi this year, they actually uh, have passed a law to allow churches to appoint gun-carrying members of their congregation to create security forces. They gave them a license to kill. They can shoot and kill the same way a police officer can, except there's less government oversight if they do it. I mean, this is just crazy, obnoxious stuff. As a secular America, uh, American, we have to condone these actions and this bigotry as being totally un-American. We believe in protecting the rights of all people, including people of faith and those with no faith at all. One thing we're trying to do, and I'm going to close on this and, and pop off the stage, I see my timekeeper over here, uh, is talk about secular values. We believe in values. Uh, and in fact, the religious right in this country does not have a trademark on values. They're the ones who keep talking about values. We believe in freedom. They don't. We believe in equality. They don't. We believe in inclusion. They don't. And clearly, they don't believe in knowledge, science, evidence. We do. Our four secular values, and you can go to secularvaluesvoter.org and read more about it. Freedom, equality, inclusion, knowledge. It unites everything we're doing. And it's going to unite this community and a broader community to create a damn strong voting bloc going forward. I'm gonna leave it on that note. Thank you for being here. Do your jobs, let's have a great day. And let's have a great tomorrow, thank you. Oh, that'll get you charged up in the morning. <laughs> so the non-religious were the fastest growing and second largest religious affiliation in this country. As a result, we know there are non-theists living in every congressional district uh, from coast to coast, but many lawmakers still believe that they have never met a non-theistic constituent or that there are none living in their district. Uh, I personally have been told this by a lawmaker, uh, a Louisiana senator, who said, I believe there are atheists living in America, but there are none in Louisiana. Thank you. Sounds a whole lot more impressive than we did 20 hours of community service here, we did 15 hours of community service there, doesn't it? When we work together, we can accomplish so much. Um, the Humanist Disaster Recovery Teams, registering as a potential volunteer, this is a, a group that was started recently and we recently had our first deployment. Um, 
this is uh, when there's a disaster, we send volunteers out to work with um, the local community to rebuild after a disaster. Um, and then the Humanist Service Corps, we have people working in Ghana who are uh, working in the witch camps. And um, I didn't end up talking about this yesterday, so I'll, I'll do a little bit more today. But um, what happens is that uh, women, they, they still believe in witchcraft over there, so women um, get accused of witchcraft, especially if they're successful and there's no logical reason for why they're successful because they're women. And um, so they, uh, something happens bad in the community and the finger gets pointed at them for witchcraft. And so they end up going to these rehabilitation camps. Um, and a lot of times, and they go voluntarily because they want to be rehabilitated and be sent, sent back to their community. But a lot of times the community will say, oh, well, we don't think you were really rehabilitated. So then they have to stay in the camps. Um, the living conditions there are deplorable. They don't have um, medical care and things like that. So we're working with the, uh, a local nonprofit there in a non-invasive, sustainable way um, that we're not taking away local jobs and local roles. We're training the locals um, in the skills that they need to help support these women. So um, those are our four programs. Now for the second way that I'm gonna tell you about our work. <clears throat> um, Rebecca Witzman, tell me who has heard of Rebecca Witzman? Okay, probably a bunch of people from yesterday. Um, <laughs> who was not here yesterday and has heard of Rebecca Witzman? Okay. Um, so she is the lady uh, who was in a F5 tornado in Moore, Oklahoma. And uh, now you know who she is, right? So now who is not here yesterday who has heard of Rebecca Witzman? A lot more of you, okay. So um, they actually heard that the tornado was coming and um, she took her young son, Anders, and escaped uh, from, the, from the house that she was at and in her car and drove a few miles away and her house was completely destroyed in this tornado. Um, she later was interviewed by Wolf Blitzer on CNN, and um, Wolf Blitzer asked her to thank God that she had survived. And she kind of said, oh, you know, and was tried, tried to be kind of discreet about it, and he pushed her. And he said, oh, you've, you know, you've got to thank God, right? And she was very sweet about it, and she said, actually, I'm an atheist, but I don't blame anybody for thanking God. And so, um, so this, uh, kind of made her very well known within the secular world. Um, and it was a very inspiring story, but there's more. Um, while she was in her home and uh, in the destroyed rubble of her home, sorting through her belongings, there were volunteers there who were religious. And they started asking her questions about her religion and asking her um, if she was raising her young son with Jesus. and. Um, you know, she, she kind of uh, evaded the question, and they really pushed her. And at a time where she was already very traumatized, um, going through the belongings of her destroyed home, they were proselytizing to her and t making her feel bad, telling her that, uh, you know, she should be raising her young son with, with religion, and how could she not do that? And she was leaving him um, open to a life of, of difficulty. Um, and she had the... Uh, the idea, she, she thought, nobody should ever have to go through this. No victim should ever have to go through this, be in their completely destroyed home and be made to feel bad because they, they aren't religious. And the fact is that 90% of disaster volunteers are religious. So, um, so this is an area, and, you know, 20% of uh, of, of the population in America is non-religious, and 35% of young people are non-religious. So we're very much underrepresented. Um, so Rebecca approached Foundation Beyond Belief and um, approached me and Dale McGowan, the former executive director, and we formed humanist disaster recovery teams. And the goal is to go out into these communities and provide a secular presence where we're not proselytizing, we're not trying to convince people not to be religious, we're just trying to help them 
to be victim-centered, which means putting the victim first and putting their needs first instead of putting our own beliefs before the needs of the victims. So that's Humanist Disaster Recovery Teams, and that's how it formed. Now, which story made you more excited about Foundation Beyond Belief's work? The last slide? Who says the last slide? And, and who says the slide before, the one where I was talking about the four programs? Two, two people. <laughs> OK. So you can see how personal storytelling really can motivate you to become engaged in an organization's work or in the purpose of an individual. Now I'm going to tell you why that is. OK. Who wrote a research paper in school? Everybody, right? So you all know the basic outline of, of a research paper. You have your introduction, your body, and your conclusion. Your introduction means that you start strong with an attention grabber. You'll notice that I didn't spend a lot of time on who I am. I'm Noelle George. You know, I had the little introduction beforehand, but I didn't give you a lot of information about when I became executive director, or what my work has been, and so on and so forth. There's time for that. I'll be around all day. You can ask me questions. Um, start strong. Start with an attention grabber. Get into what you want to talk about early. Um, give a brief overview. I told you that I was going to give you two different stories and tell you what, you know, ask you about the difference between the two. Um, state your thesis. I did that in the introduction. And then the body. Present your main points and give strong examples. That's what I'm doing now. I gave you the two examples um, of how I talked about Foundation Beyond Belief's work, and now I'm telling you why the second one was more effective. And then your conclusion, restate your thesis, summarize your main points, and end with a strong clincher statement that ties everything together. The basic outline of a story is really similar. In 30 seconds, as many points as you possibly can in 30 seconds. What you're going to do, I'm going to demonstrate here with Amy. There is some very hopeful thinking in the press. Sir, the orgies at five. Just saying, it's not that. Keep your clothes on, sir. Okay. What's going to happen is when I say go, you're going to put your hand down and put your grip your hand as like just like that. And here's the only rule: every time my thumb is on top of my partner's thumb, uh, Amy. There we go. <laughs> I'm the point. Every time her thumb is on top of my thumb. Yeah. Amy earns a point. Thirty seconds. Earn as many points as you possibly can. Ready? You're right here. Ready? You're in a position? And go!
So what we're going to do is demonstrate what they did. So here's the key thing. Most of you, just like I did the first five times as I played this game, we went back to like the hind brain, the primitive part of brain. And you overrode what I said. So what I said was earn as many points as possible. And what most of you translate that to was beat the hell out of your partner. <laughs> but what some folks said is, wait a second. The way I learn as much in life, the way I make as much positive change as possible is to help those on my side. And instead, she has no idea what we're going to do now. Instead of just trying to fight, we take turns. Boom, 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 faster, even faster. Oh, yeah, yeah. I will give you a hint, by the way, for those that have said they cheated, that's also the reptilian brain. Yeah. That's the part of your brain that says, you're not atheist enough. <laughs> Something like that, right? <laughs> okay, so I just want to leave us with one little quick lesson on this one, which is I want us to think as we go through life, as secular people, because I think we have a hope for the future, by the way, right? That when we can approach people and look for a, a way for that person to win and me to win, when I approach my brother who's a Christian, my sister who talks to spirits, right, to come with love, understanding, and to gently bring in the truth. So we both win as much as possible. Now, speaking of winning as much as possible, we have our comedian, which I said has come all the distance from D.C. to here, right? Blocks and blocks to be here. Martin Amini. Now, he has fronted for one of my favorite comedians ever. You might have heard of Trevor Noah. Yeah. Yes. He's like, no, but look it up later, sir. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. After the orgy. <laughs> same guy. Same guy. Um, there's always one in every crowd if we're lucky. So Martin Armini, all right, so he's toured all over the country. He's been on the New York City Comedy Show, and I think he's slotted to take over the Tonight Show in about 20 years. Yeah. So big round of applause, everybody. Martin Armini! Uh, Sunday Assembly makes you know you're going to have a good time today. Yeah. You know, I can tell this is going to be an awesome audience already because it's very diverse. We have all different types of white people here. This is fantastic. A lot of black shirts. I love it. Uh, it feels like a Lincoln convention. I'm ready to network. Great. Uh, <laughs> People have a hard time figuring out where I'm from. That's been one of my struggles my whole life. I'm racially ambiguous. Um, recently did a show in New York, and I asked the audience member, I said, excuse me, sir, where do you think I'm from? And the guy just yelled out, you look like an Uber driver. <laughs> the messed up part is I really am an Uber driver. I can't just about accurate and racist at the same time. I've been doing comedy so long that it's starting to interfere with the way I interact with my passengers. The other day, a passenger found out I was a comedian. He's like, oh my god, you're a comedian? Tell me a joke. I'm like, all right, hold on, ladies. Let me get my mind together. I just had a couple of drinks, all right? She's like, oh my god, are you serious? I'm like, just joking. <laughs> like, oh my god, you're awesome. Four stars. Just four stars? Clap your hands if you're from out of town, you're visiting from out of town. Oh, right. This is the reason you guys are helping me pay my sprint bill because Uber is all I got and surge prices have been awesome. All right? Uh, just have one note. Uh, when you have an Uber, when you're in an Uber, please give me the five stars. If you're a good Uber, you know, I'm very sensitive about the star rating. Sir, please. All right? I, I, do, I go out of my way, bottle of waters for my passengers, you know, mints for my bros. My white passenger paid Mumford and Sons on Pandora. Like I did market research to get these five stars. Yeah. Comedy's going good for me right now at this time of my career. I'm starting to travel a lot more. And uh, I recently did a show in uh, Timonium, Maryland. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Timonium. Uh, okay, one person, good for you. You escaped? Good. I got off stage and a guy in a cowboy hat came up to me and was like, Hey man, I don't usually laugh at Mexicans, but you were hilarious. I go, thanks man, I appreciate it, but I'm actually half Iranian, half Bolivian. He's like, yeah, I don't like them either. And 
I'm just looking at this guy in the cowboy hat, and I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, man, this is progress. You know what I mean? Like, it is a racist moment, but it's still a cowboy and this is this is really so amazing to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm very excited. Cause y'all y'all could have been anywhere tonight. Y'all could have been in a room watching TV or something. <laughs> That's where I was. They called me like, you have a show. I'm like, oh wait a minute, Golden Girls are on. <laughs> Thank you for being a friend. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> I still love that show. Is that sad? Oh my god. I love the Golden Girls. I like, I'm really Dorothy, but I like to channel my inner Blanche whenever I can. <laughs> Thank you for knowing what that means. Oh my god. Here's the thing, I, I actually haven't watched the show in a while because I hate watching it on Lifetime. Those movies still mess with your head, don't they? Oh my God, when you watch a Lifetime movie, I start thinking my husband's gonna cheat on me with a babysitter, they're gonna kidnap my kids while I adopt from the drug addicted mother who's pursuing me for custody and stopping nothing to destroy me that my boss is sexually harassing me and both become emotion that I deserve it. Oh my God, that's wrong. <laughs> Somebody laughs, and you just tickle my touch to move. All right. <laughs> oh my God. I do watch too much TV. I, you know, I used to love watching TV. Like, my, one of my favorite shows is still Law and Order. Anyone know what I'm saying? Because you know what? There's just nothing like a nice, wholesome murder at the end of the day. <laughs> you know, it takes the edge off. That show messed me up, though, because huh? I want to be a lawyer until I realize cases really aren't solved in an hour. <laughs> They're not gonna graduate law school with a soundtrack. Dum dum. <laughs> <laughs> Love law shows though. Love, you know, because law shows, watching watching crime shows has really taught me a very important lesson. Uh, it pays to be an A student. Because if you're an A student and you go missing, they look for you. <laughs> <laughs> if you a D student, you gonna be duct taking the trunk. Going, damn, I should have studied more. <laughs> Hey, students find that very funny. These students laugh so much. <laughs> oh, man, Netflix changed the game, man. Did you know what? I am binge watching. Like, oh, oh, my God. Like, I, you guys, I just I binge watched 10 seasons for Future Rock. <laughs>
red paint past the damn peanut butter. <laughs> Bloodsuckers feels way more realistic than the bloodsucking political campaign that's going on right now. Oh my God! I, I, you know what? Here's that. I tried. I tried watching the debates, the political debates, um, over you know the course of the spring. I really tried to sort of clockwork orange my way through it. <laughs> Please don't send me back out there. <laughs> this is where knowledge is happening. <laughs> no, it, it, it's, it's very difficult. You know, watching the debates, and here's the thing, I think the debates for me would have a, have a little bit more credibility. That, well, here, here's my issue. I'm tired, I'm really tired of rich people running wrong. Just once, I'd like to see somebody running their entire campaign on coupons. <laughs> There's somebody trying to make it happen with a Kickstarter. <laughs> but still, no, those debates, to me, would have been a little bit more credible if just one of the candidates, just one of them, showed up late to the debate. Because they had to work overtime. <laughs> Showed up with their kids because they couldn't afford a babysitter. <laughs> Was wearing a suit that they bought on sale with the tag still on it because <laughs> they're going to return it the next day. <laughs> That's the candidate I might look at. Oh my gosh. Because me, everybody turned in, I shouldn't say everybody, a lot of people turned in to the debates because uh, Donald Trump made it interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, Donald Trump has gone from interesting to, um, yes, yes, yes. Thank you for jumping in when I needed you. Yeah, at this point, it's like, mm, I should really renew my passport. Uh, I might need a land of refuge. This man is amazing. I'm trying not to 
pay attention, but I can't help it. I can't help it. He wanna, he wanna build a wall between us and Mexico to keep the Mexican immigrants from coming in and taking our job. I guess uh, the joke's on them because our jobs are in India. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so they, I, I look at him, you know, and then my TV brain takes over. I think, you know what? Like, if I'm Trump on Game of Thrones, <laughs> he'd be a Lannister. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Put him in Slytherin. I can't dream, I can't dream that Donald Trump was on The Walking Dead. Yes, yes, the zombies bit him. They turned into Republicans.
We'll come back stronger next year. We're going to learn from this experience. I mean, you know what they say. Everything happens for the reason. <laughs> Just 
because of the United States. A condom is just herpes, okay? <laughs> By the way, that's just a joke. Uh, <laughs> my friend, my friend goes, well, you, you prove your point 100% beyond any other possibility of any other possibility. I'm like, well, I don't know what that means, so no. Um, he goes, like, 100%. I go, well, no, of course not. He goes, well, then I got you. You don't know. I'm like, well, I all can see that. I don't know. He goes, oh, when it comes to Jesus, I know. And I'm like, no, man, you believe. And that's cool. He goes, no, I know. I'm like, no, you believe. I know. I'm like, you believe. I know. We got to that. I know. You believe. I know. You believe. I know. You're going to find it. Look, this word, no, I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> Right? So it makes me think, what if he was our literal father? What if he was our actual father? 
right? Think about some of the shit you can't eat. You can't cut the sides of your hair, you can't eat lobster, you can't eat, you can't eat, you can't eat pork, you can't eat, uh, what you, 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 can't, you can't touch a woman or anything a woman's touch because she's got a period. And these things are punishable by death and burning for eternity in hellfire. Not time out. <laughs> Not lose your allowance for a week, young man. Eternal hellfire. I thought my dad was strict. He once beat me with a Lincoln log for fighting my sister over the Barbie dream car. All right, he's got nothing on this guy. And then I realized, imagine if he was our real father, child protective services would be all over his ass, right? <laughs> and that's what I realized. Maybe that's what the devil is. Child protective services. <laughs> it would make a lot of sense. Think about it. The devil's always trying to lure us away from our heavenly father. It would explain why hell sucks so bad. It's an underfunded government program. <laughs> yeah, like, look, I get it, okay? I'm sorry. We're in the basement. It's hot. But maybe if we could get the goddamn 1% to pay some of their fucking fair share, we could put out some of these fires. Get an air conditioner down there. <laughs> Good God, I'd love to bring back casual Fridays. It's not a budget, all right? I just don't like when people go door to door. I'll say that. Don't go door to door. Right? Because it's just a fight. I realize I'm not doing the religion. You know why I don't like when people go door to door? I realize why we all don't like it. It's because it's your weekend. It's your Saturday. It's your Sunday. You know? And they're there to talk to you on your time while you're doing your shit. But they're there to talk about their shit. It wouldn't bother you if they were there to talk about your shit. <laughs> it may not be on your 